going to start at the end of the road tonight. And uh, I'm going to go back and see where it all began and work our way back up. Oh, the hard rain on First Avenue after midnight, kind of like the one we had last night. A broke down old drunk man stumbled down First Avenue in the rain, trying hard not to slide away. Cut up most of the by his cane. With his good arm, he's supporting a girl with a swelled up foot that hurts. Slow steps moving forward and jerking and staggering back and spurred. She's hanging on tight, teeth clenched. Fighting to hold back screams of pain. She hoists a broke umbrella, struggling for cover from the rain. Two poor lost souls, knowing they can't do it on their own. Stumbling down First Avenue together, trying hard to find their way back home. Just a broke down old drunk man and a pretty young thing in pain. Wandering through purgatory in this godforsaken rain. Now we're gonna go back to the beginning, where it all started, at Charlie's Log Cabin Inn. It's the late 1940s, I'm six or seven years old. It's a blistering hot August afternoon. I'm on my grandmother's back lawn in rural South Jersey, watching as Uncle Leon removes the washboard from Grandmom's large middle wash tub. He places it carefully against the post on the side of the back porch, lifts up one side of the large tub and tips it over. A wave of soap and bleach water wash out across the ground. I watch and I weep. Moments later, big fat night crawlers start popping up through the grass and suds like magic. I grab them and I stuff them in a Maxwell House coffee can. I spread a little dirt on them, cover it with wax paper, put a rubber band around the wax paper and poke a fork through it, leaving four holes for air. Stash the can under the shade under the porch to save it for when I go fishing. Uncle Leon takes my hand and walks me across the lawn and down the side of the road about 20 yards. We pass our neighbor Charlie the goat man's house cross over the blacktop and head down a narrow dirt road past the chicken yankee's house. He's that weird neighbor all the kids are afraid of. I push in close to Uncle Leon's leg and hold tight on his, on his hand as we pass because I'm hoping chicken yankee won't put the malocchio on me. <laughs> we cut to an opening in a split rail fence encircling the lawn with a long low log cabin in the center. There are old wagon wheels propped up with sticks on the lawn. Looks like a stagecoach stop in a John Wayne Western movie. As we get closer to the cabin door, the small neon sign flashes, Charlie's Log Cabin Inn. Uncle Leon pushes open the heavy wooden door. I'm wild with excitement, but I have no idea. The darkness blinds me for a minute, but I feel the cool air of the room on my cheeks, and there's a smell of cigarette smoke and ashtrays and beer and peanuts. I hear a Phillies game on the radio. Eddie Wakus is on second and Richie Ashburn hits a homer and ties up the game. As my eyes slowly adjust, I can make out a dim light over a circular bar in a large open room with hot beams of intense sunlight shooting across the floor from tiny windows. There's some booths in the back, a, a jukebox and a shuffleboard, and there's a cigarette machine by the door and a pinball machine by the front wall. It's an old Gottlieb machine with little Abner and Daisy May painted on the glass. And Daisy May's wearing a really close, low-cut, tight fit blouse. My uncle picks me up and he sits me on the bar and pulls up a stool. He orders a Coke for me and a beer for himself, pops a stick match with his fingernail, lights up, and takes a long, slow draw on a lucky strike while the barkeep draws his beer. He turns and he winks at me. And we share the knowing smile of two pals on a road trip. The bartender yells over, hey kid, what's your name? I shyly answer, Philip. Comes back from the register, hands off Leon the beer, offers me a handful of nickels painted with red nail polish. Ever played pinball, Philip? My face lights up like a neon sign. I nod a solid yeah and I yell a quick thanks and I leap from the bar with one handful of red nickels, one handful of peanuts, arms pushed up high in the air and I'm making a mad dash for Daisy May with a shitty grid wider than the Grand Canyon. For me that moment was frozen in time forever because I knew I was home. Yeah. I spent the best years of my life in dive bars. 
There's still a few good ones left in the East Village, but they'll be gone before long, thanks to high rents. When I moved to New York in 1968, I was amazed to find it was actually a franchise chain of dive bars. They were called, they were called Blarney Stone. They were as common as the Starbucks out of there. Do you remember those? Yeah, they were like Starbucks. They were everywhere. They catered to blue-collar workers, alcoholic housewives, sailors, construction workers, bike messengers, hookers, pimps, old drunks, white-collar executives who didn't want their co-workers to see them banging out six martinis for lunch, and out-of-work actors like me. There's actually still one remaining Blondie Stone in 8th Avenue by Penn Station. I spent a lot of hours in that one back in 61 and 62 when I was passing through New York in the service. They had steam tables with mashed potatoes, string beans, and the best corned beef, roast beef, and roast pork sandwiches in the city. You always get away with the excuse that you were stopping by Blarney Stone to get a corned beef sandwich and then get smashed in the middle of the day. <laughs> was what really brought a hardcore afternoon drinkers to Blarney Stone was cheap booze. Ounce and a half shots of bottom shelf shit. What you, what you guys call well drinks? 25 cents with a Coke chaser. 35 cents with a short beer chaser. Every hour was happy hour of Blarney Stone. I like to think I'm a little more sophisticated now. I enjoy the taste of single malt scotch, California wine, French brandy, and aged bourbon. Mostly when other people are lying, of course. But I gotta tell you. I still have nostalgia for old Philadelphia, Corby's, Shenley's, and Three Feathers. Cheap shit that bites the back of your throat, lets your stomach know something bad's coming down. <laughs> Whenever I look back on good times when I think of good friends, all my best memories seem imprinted with the smell, the taste, and the bite of bottom shelf whiskey and dive bars. Maybe it's feel warm inside. I wish I were young again and still had a stomach that could handle cheap booze. <laughs> it's late. I'm sitting alone at the bar working on my fourth double jack. And I'm feeling pretty mellow. She leans across two seats, taps me on the shoulder, stares me dead in the face, and she slurs out, You look just like Pablo Picasso. <laughs> I usually get Einstein. <laughs> She's really pretty. I guess late 30s, early 40s, baby. Sculpted cheekbones, a great body packed in tight black leather. Her hair is long and straight, dyed black, with bangs almost covering those haunted, crazy eyes. <laughs> exactly the, the woman I'm always a sucker for in the bar tonight. <laughs> Pablo Picasso, yeah, I bet you get that all the time, huh? No, not really. <laughs> She sees my fancy camera on the bar and says, Hey, you're a photographer! I said, sometimes, mostly, I just tell stories. She flashes a broad Cheshire cat to Hey, me too! And she drifts off into some rambling drug story with a couple of lame attempts at being funny. I say, you know, everything you say seems to have a sardonic twist at the end or something, like a comedian. And she coyly looks up at me and says, Well, that's because I've come to comedian. What kind of comedy do you do? She says, Dada. A <laughs> Dada comedian, yeah, really. It seemed to be that fucking deaf, I don't think so. She asked me, what kind of comedy do you do? I repeat, I'm not a comic, I tell stories. Well, I'll bet my stories are a hell of a lot more interesting than yours. She slowly moves her face and her lips in close to an attack position. I said, wait a minute, hey, I have a Speedo at home that's older than you. She dusts me off. Hey, you couldn't come close to my stories. You ever been crack? Uh, no, I stopped, I stopped at Nestle and Coke, obviously. You she again ignores my comment. Well, what comedian do you like? Well, I don't know, Richard Pryor and Lenny Bruce were my old favorites. I get, uh, Sarah Silverman and Andy Kaufman. Wow, you know everybody thinks I am Sarah Silverman? Really? I can see that. Actually, in a dark bar with enough drinks in me, she doesn't look like Sarah Silverman. And Andy Kaufman was my hero. He was my role model. She rests her hand on my thigh. 
my Cialis instantly kicks in. <laughs> so, telling my body I'm 40 years old again, and Jack Daniels, he's up in my head, he's agreeing, he's whispering in my head, go for it, man, you can do this. <laughs> she seems pretty intelligent, somewhat creative, attractive, very sexy, and very fucked up. <laughs> Just my kind of girl. I give her my card and I invite her to my next show, of course. Why do they still entice me, these beautiful, intelligent crazies? <laughs> and why do they still seek me out? Do they see the leftover crazy in these old eyes past the wrinkles and the beat up face? <laughs> Shouldn't she be able to see in me that it doesn't work? I'm living proof. I have the scars from battles lost with crazy drugs and movies. <laughs> More important, why do I feel this incredible emotional and sexual magnetism here? It's an old feeling, it feels good. It's just a Cialis and a Jack Daniels, really a chemical reaction? I don't think so. I know better, but I still want to throw her in the back of a 60 Triumph Bonneville race off to some cheap motel and make hard banded love to her. We're crazy, that's what we do, ain't it? Feel bad tomorrow, right? We're both losers, heading for a Bonnie and Clyde ending here. <laughs> Pablo Picasso, Sarah Solomon. <laughs> Two fucked up souls irreversibly driving into a head-on, dead-on collision. She leads in and she hugs me way too tight. I feel myself wanting a lot more, but you know, sometimes age actually imparts little bits of wisdom. I pick up my camera and I head for the door. I hear him yelling behind me, Hey Pablo, where are you going, man? Why are you leaving? I've been in the same sad movie way too many times. I'm not sticking around for the bad ending anymore. Most days I feel like I'm dream walking through a life that's a graveyard. Ghost voices from all the bars I ever hung out in, they keep calling out to me to come home. And I know I belong there with them. I struggle to exist in the real world. I spent a lifetime faking it. I knew what I had to do to keep it together. I'm really good at it. But they're calling me. In some dark corner of my soul, I know I was born to be there with them. Destined to sit alone forever on a stool at the far end of some dive bar. Somehow I escaped. I managed to have a real life for a while. Thanks to a woman who cared enough about me to love me in spite of myself. That's all over now. And they're still out there. They're waiting for me to come back. I used to think I could escape for good. But I know it's my real home. It's the only place I ever fit in, the only place I ever really belong. I feel like I'm destined to spend eternity in a broken down bus station bar in some shithole city drinking bottom shelf rot gun, feeling lonely and sad and wishing for the life I already have. <laughs> Rod Stewart said every picture tells a story. Well, there's a story here. There's a lady in this room tonight who has this same, same exact tattoo. And here's her story. She, she registers with this online dating site, fills out the form, and posts a picture. Within minutes, she gets a text response from some guy who says he likes her nose. She doesn't answer. Moments later, he texts again, Are you dangerous? She doesn't respond. A few minutes pass, he sends her a dick pic. Real romantic we got here, huh? In what universe is that supposed to be some kind of turn on for a woman? He has no idea who the hell he's dealing with here. Let's get back to the are you dangerous question for a minute. It's Sunday afternoon. She's sitting alone at the far end of the bar. She's chatting up my buddy, the bartender. I come in and I take a seat at the opposite end. Joint's empty except for the two of us. I'm sitting there for like five minutes watching her bat her eyes at my buddy. He's totally oblivious to my presence. I clear my throat a couple times. Then I fake a loud cough, finally extracting him from her talons. And he strolls over and makes us look my usual. We pick up exactly where we left off last on the typical bar flag bullshit conversation. She's eavesdropping. And she later tells me, she knew immediately, that A, I'm someone who wouldn't notice or remember her, and B, I'm someone whose skin she definitely wants to get under. 
part A not true. I don't make a habit of starting conversations with strangers, drinking alone in an empty bar on a Sunday afternoon. I figure they might have come here because they want some space. What the fuck? Let the games begin. She, she starts with Bukowski, do I like him? <laughs> It becomes very apparent very quickly that whatever I reply will be immediately rebutted by a deliberately opposite opinion. <laughs> Devil's advocate? I'm thinking more like Happy Hour Wallbuster here. So, part of the truth. Someone is getting under my skin. She pissed me off. Mission accomplished. I respond in kind. You know how you get dog shit on your shoe and you can't seem to shake it off? Uh, call it fate or whatever, I keep running into her at all my favorite joints. She's only like a pit bull. She won't let go. She challenges me on everything I say. But, you know they say, time wounds all heals? Uh, what begins as a confrontational ghoul of wits slowly and imperceptibly grows into fascination, interest, respect, and finally, a challenging and enduring friendship flavored with lots of happy hour whiskey and good stimulating conversations. So back to that question, is she dangerous? I'm thinking on this, watching as she inhales long and slow in that American spirit menthol, her idle hand is tapping softly on the bar, a dirge of broken hearts, false starts, and roads going nowhere. So if dangerous means tangling with some sexy, smart lady who could go shot for shot with you while fucking with your head and you're still liking it, then yeah, she's dangerous. She's very hot. And I like her nose too. Two scabby old street drunks with broken faces are sitting on the window ledge of the vitamin store on 1st Avenue and 14th Street. They're sharing a bottle in a bag, bumming smokes from passers-by, and discussing the meaning of existence. Considering their current situation, I'm thinking they might not have really found the answer yet. But I guess it's good they're working on it. <laughs> Inertia. Inertia is the tendency of a body in motion to remain in motion. She oozes the seductive scent of salami. With body moves as flexible as a Russian gymnast. She is the temptress Delilah armed and ready to shear. Thank God I don't have any hair. <laughs> she approaches slowly like a stalking panther with the hypnotic stare of a snake charmer's cobra. Body ever swaying side to side in a perpetual fluid motion. She defines inertia. Taking the seat beside me at the bar, the room is suddenly showered with pheromones like butterflies emerging from a warm cocoon. Every man in that bar picks up the scent and feels hunted, stalked and becomes preoccupied with the thought of having her. Every woman snaps to attention. A gauntlet's been thrown down here. There's that sticky sweet smell of competition in the air. Cold stares over crossed arms and sad stern looks of resentment only add to the heavy sexual tension in the room. She converses not so much with words, but with gestures, casual touches and soft caresses. I'm wary of intrigue fascinated and totally immersed in the pheromone frenzy she's created around our little corner of the bar. Conversation requires very few words. Our minds spark an electric shock connection, revealing a oneness of thought, emotion, and experience is mutually shared. There's a likeness of spirit and will that overshadows even the heavy sexuality. Thoughts and feelings pass between us that have remained largely unshared until now. We know that we are brother and sister of that same cosmic mother and share the same damaged, broken soul. She's the incarnate female version of the troubled intellectual demon that was me on my journey of self-destruction those many eons ago. For Eve in the garden, there's only one possible endgame to this tangled, strange encounter. Consummation. The Fakir's charmed servant offers up the forbidden fruit. This bar, the garden. The onlookers, the almighty who will judge. And I, the decaying remnant of the very first man, am to decide the outcome of this timeless invitation. The apple has been offered. 
Adam must decide if binding vows previously spoken will now be broken. Truly a conundrum of biblical proportion. You can always find Johnny E. in the last seat at the end of the bar for happy hour at the International over on First Avenue and Southern Street. Three Fingers Bushmill, neat. Always dressed to the nines with a carefully arranged and shellac comb over and wearing that classic powder blue polyester sport coat he got 43 years ago back in 72 on his way home from Vietnam. Hey, Johnny E., I haven't seen you for a while. Where you been? Uh, fucking ambulance took an emergency at Bellevue and sent a VA hospital. Eight weeks up there with pneumonia. And then they told me I got a bad liver to boot. Goddamn landlord rents out my apartment to a woman with a kid because he hasn't seen me. He thinks I'm dead. 35 years of my life, he threw in a fucking dumpster. And then my car's gone. I go down to the tunnel pound, they auction off my car for 75 bucks. They said I owe $2,300 in tow charges, fines, and storage fees. I got 468 bucks in my savings account. I'm running out of fucking options here, you know? He spends happy hours at the International for a few more weeks till the stash runs out. Just trying to stay warm, keep a little buzz going. Whether it gets cold or panhandling ain't working either. I run into him again. He's sleeping on a heat vent by the Chase Bank on 2nd Avenue. We spot him at 20. Hey Johnny, how's it going? Rejoice, rejoice. We got no choice, right? I need to try the VA again. I was a door gunner on a UE back in Nam, you know. Company A, 1st Battalion, 35th Infantry. I lit up a lot of BC with that big 50 man. No retreat, no surrender. Fucking A, brother. They owe us something, right? I don't see Johnny anymore that winter on the street or at the International. Late one night, I'm over at the black and white on 10th Street, shooting a shit with Harry the Hat. Out of nowhere, he says, hey, remember Johnny E? Frankie the cop tells me they found him dead in the room over at the St. Mark's Hotel back in March. Yeah, face down at a Swanson TV dinner. Mac and cheese, I think he said. And he was still wearing that fucking polyester sport coat. You know what was sad? Frankie said nobody claimed his body. You believe that shit? Hey, Billy, three fingers push, Bill, neat. Johnny Keith. No retreat, no surrender. Fucking A, brother. <laughs> my last piece, I'm going to give you a preview of uh, the opening of my next show. It'll be a Cordelius week, I think, January 6th. It'll be called Readers, including me, and there's three or four folks in this room will be reading there along with me. So, welcome to the Losers Club. I joined the Losers Club in the summer of 1954. Until then, I'm this beautiful, relatively innocent young kid. Older boy, honor student, teacher's pet, and I'm working on a scholarship to St. Joe's Prep. The hormones have a way of kicking in and fucking with it, just when things are going good. My dick is hard all the time. I break out in a flurry of technicolor acting. My face looks like a pepperoni pizza with small volcanoes of melted and cheese leaking out. Yeah, it's fucking disgusting, even to me. Wet dreams, constant sexual fantasies, and frequent masturbation are my only outlet. <laughs> Until I discover alcohol and dancing. <laughs> fueled, by, fueled by Seagram 7, I gained a re reputation as a great fast dancer. What we used to call jitterbugging back then. I win every dance contest I ever entered. But I can't get a date to save my life or a girl with slow dance. I have no idea how to talk to women. The lines my friends are using weren't great for them. Come off sounding fake when I use them. I feel like an alien. I stare longingly at those couples dancing to those slow do up songs. My heart's breaking. The Shirelle, the Anders, and the Hearts, the Flatters, the Skyrunners, the Mouth Tones, the Cuff Tones. Makes me want to cry, but that ain't an option for a punk ass guinea kid in South Philly in the 50s. All I really want to do is just fit in. I can't seem to figure out how everybody else does. I watch the school in crowd with jocks and yearbook staff and prom kings, prom queens, cool pickle free guys who seem to attract women like magnets. I'm lonely and sad. I let somebody love me like in those doo-wop songs. It just ain't happening. I'm 14 years old. What the fuck? This sucks. <laughs> My sadness simmers until it finally boils up as anger. That's something I think I can deal with now. I see the movie The Wild One. I immediately identify with those bandit bikers. 
a second hand store, provide me with a motorcycle jacket and engineer boots that almost fit. My hair is all slicked back with Vaseline petroleum gel because I can't afford the real stuff. But in summer it melts in the heat. It leaks down my face and my neck, so trying to look dangerous ain't working too good for me either. But I do manage to get kicked out of Catholic school. I'm eventually forced to accept that I'm part of that group of pimple-faced rejects, skims, greasers, tomboys, chubbies, nerds, geeks, flat-chested chicks, kids who read too much, sissies, and boys who suck at sports. I'm a fucking loser. In the long run, it turns out to be a good person. Yeah, I cover my wounds with whiskey and books for a while, which eventually leads to writing. Totally immersed in books, I discovered that feeling weird, excluded, and rejected has produced a lot of really good writers. Hey. I submerge myself with Kerouac and all the other beat writers that I leave home at 18 to join the pilgrimage on the road, and we're searching for Self-discovery and the meaning of existence. Yeah. That turns out to be a long, hard road and a damn bumpy one at that. Ten years later, though, I'm on the hippie trail to the promised land, the East Village. New York City. I'm home. Looking back at it all, it had to happen just that way for me to become what I was meant to be all along, a downtown writer performer. We're mostly losers club alumni down here. I fit in just fine. Tour buses take those old jocks and prom queens down here to gawk at us. We stare back, thankful that we never became the dull-eyed, bloated, middle-class suburban robots they turned into. Those sweating peacock lives peaked at 18 years old, and now look at them, they look like fat, waddling pickings. Our fledgling days might have taken a hell of a lot longer, but hey, Look at us. We all turned into swans. Ain't that the ultimate revenge of the nerds?